Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd uh, like to introduce here Josh with Bison Interests. He's a very exciting and knowledgeable speaker. And without uh, any further delay, I'm going to pass uh, the webinar over to him. So just give me a second here. Okay, you should be good to go. Okay, great. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining and thank you, Bob, for having me. Um, it's a great uh, privilege to get to speak to you guys and I'll try to keep it relatively short um, I have a lot to get through and happy to focus on whatever topics are most of interest to you guys and happy to try to get to a question and answer portion of this uh, as soon as possible. Um, so again, thank you very much for having me. Um, what, what I'm going to do is uh, the topic is oil inflation and kind of an update in the oil and gas markets. And what we're going to do is first go through um, my background a little bit and Bison's background a little bit to show kind of why it matters, kind of what we think about this. Uh, you know, I'm a little younger than I think the average uh, participant in this webinar and um, have a little less experience. And so I think it's helpful to kind of share kind of what I've been doing and what Bison has been doing and kind of like why the analysis that we're providing is relevant. Um, very important from a compliance perspective. None of this is an offer to invest in Bison. Um, an offer can only be made through offering documents. Uh, we tried to pull out as much return information as possible while still providing some evidence of like what we've been doing from a macro perspective and how those macro calls that we're seeing relevant to this topic have translated uh, in the stock market and kind of what the opportunities look like broadly, not necessarily specifically to Bison. So again, um, Bison can only be offered to qualified or accredited investors, um, and none of this is an offer. And that's very important from an investment fund perspective. Um, it is a private fund. It's not a mutual fund or anything like that. And the goal of this is to help educate and update uh, the, the members of this investment group. So what I'm going to do now is show, I'm going to turn off this uh, web, uh, webcam. It's just helpful to, to show everyone <laughs> I exist. Um, and then we're turning this off and we're going to show my screen and we're going to pull up this slide presentation. And so in theory, this should be showing this slide presentation. Um, it looks so, good, Josh. Great. Okay. Great. So, um, so we're, uh, I'm with Bison. I'm going to give, like I said, a little bit of background on Bison and then uh, move into the, the topic of oil and inflation. And again, I think it's important to share this given a uh, relatively new audience and some of the interesting things and very kind of variant view things we've been sharing recently publicly um, and how well they've done and how contrarian they've been. Um, Again, like when you come out and say that the Federal Reserve Chairman is wrong for specific reasons and very contrary to the general narrative, it's really important to be able to substantiate that. Um, so um, here's a little bit about Bison. Um, we're uh, a investment fund focused on oil and gas stocks. Um, so again, not necessarily the first place that you'd think to go from a macro analyst perspective. Um, I have somewhat recently been featured on um, Reuters, Bloomberg, et cetera, uh, been on Al Jazeera, which is always an interesting opportunity to get to connect with um, kind of the Middle East perspective on the oil and gas markets. Um, and, uh, you know, serve as a trusted advisor, ran an oil and gas company, sold it, um, so have some kind of specific industry experience. And then um, specifically bison, um, the concept is that the bison is the only animal that faces into the storm and gets through it safely and quickly versus the other animals that turn and run and suffer the consequences of such. So uh, let's see if we can get this to work. There we go. Okay, so this is just um, kind of what we do at Bison, again, from a stock perspective, and we're gonna tie this into the macro and then tie it into the subject. Again, this should be real brief. Um, we basically find companies that are well-run, 
um, that are at a discount to comparable companies and a discount to liquidation value with good assets and strong balance sheets. And we identify catalysts, and in many cases recently, especially given the devastation of the industry, um, the investment industry related to oil and gas during COVID, um, many of the catalysts are macro driven or driven by kind of specific mispricings that our analysis is able to uncover. Um, so our view is that good process leads to good outcomes. Bad outcomes don't necessarily mean bad processes, but in aggregate over time, doing the right research, focusing on the right things can lead to a good outcome. I know it might seem obvious, but also is very interesting in kind of this almost like post-truth, post, -truth, post uh, you know, fact, narrative-driven meme stock world, um, this sort of process still works and it's important to reiterate that. Um, so here's a few macro views that we took recently. And again, these were extremely contrarian. This is a little bit of a busy chart, um, but what we're showing is three different specific views where, and we were looking for kind of like headlines to show up opposite this and maybe should have included that. But like we came out October 15th, the glut is over, Waha Hub natural gas um, is now at a premium. Um, that day, Bloomberg had a headline article that was published the next day in many newspapers around the world talking about Waha natural gas prices going to zero and how that would be problematic for a while. Midcon, November 3rd, we came out saying the Midcon market is at a premium and it's going to be at a premium for a while. Around the same time, there were headline stories across a number of newspapers and a number of outlets and a number of research analysts from investment banks saying that this would be problematic for a while. Similar with Canada this year, March 15th came out, good news for Western Canada. Um, Canada has been a market that we've looked at intermittently and invested in intermittently over the last number of years. Um, it's somewhere that we have a lot of expertise. Uh, at the same time, many analysts were expre expressing negative views on Canadian oil. There was lots of fear, uncertainty, doubt, um, kind of bad analysis going out there in a number of different ways. Um, in each of these cases, we bought the stocks that were linked to these macro theses after the price was already at the point that we expected it to go to from a market perspective, but the stock prices hadn't moved yet. Again, there's been kind of this evisceration of the oil and gas sector. And so that's why it matters a lot to us to get our catalyst right. And if it's a macro catalyst to do a lot of work and be right on it, because if we're right, the potential financial returns from being right on macro can be life-changing. And so if you see on the bottom of this uh, page, and again, none of this is indicative of Bison's returns necessarily. This isn't an offer to invest in Bison. This is just showing getting the macro right can lead to literally life-changing returns. Um, we excluded the name of the stock on the bottom left that was most tied to Waha. We haven't disclosed that publicly yet. Um, Sandridge was the company exposed to Midcon. Baytex was a company most exposed to Western Canadian uh, differential. And each of these, um, we show not only the absolute performance uh, on a percentage basis in blue, we also show um, the two relevant indexes um, to, to look at XLE and XOP, which are ETFs that people use to get exposure to oil and gas. So those are up, but they're up nowhere near as much as these specific stocks are. And this is again, a reason to get the catalyst right and to get, if the macro is the catalyst, to get the macro right, because again, these can be absolutely game-changing. Um, one more kind of, this is a very busy slide, but if you look at the left, we show our thesis, which was that the Midcon was a premium. We also actually published our thesis on Sandridge. Um, it's amazing because we, we put this out both on our website as well as on Seeking Alpha. We tweeted about it. And I mean, not only were there news headlines saying that we were wrong um, and not specifically addressing us, of course, but uh, addressing this subject, um, but many comments are still out there in the public forum about how we don't understand this, how natural gas or natural gas liquids in the area wouldn't recover, won't recover, have all these problems. And again, it's kind of amazing because fast forward just a few months and the local price had already moved up by the time we bought it, but it went up even more and it got in the headlines um, during the Texas winter storm. And as you can see on the bottom right, um, Sandridge, despite having a strong balance sheet, 
and actually net cash, so no debt, net cash, the stock has performed more than double the XOP index, and it's performed like 7x better than XLE, which again is kind of the standard uh, index that people use to get exposure to oil and gas. So getting on the left, the macro right, getting the right financial instrument to express the macro view or to the right, uh, I guess the flip side of that is finding the right stock and understanding the catalyst and um, evaluating it correctly can lead to really substantial outperformance. And again, in this case, this wasn't about taking more risk. This is actually taking less risk. It was a low valuation stock. It had a strong balance sheet. It had turnaround management in that had been put in by Carl Icahn with a very specific no drilling, just like selling assets, paying off debt, building cash on the balance sheet, very low risk activities. Um, so this was a lower risk way to earn a higher return and again, driven by macro analysis. So uh, again, if it feels like I'm hitting it over the head a little bit, uh, it's intentional. Um, this is it's remarkable what this sort of analysis can lead to in terms of the results from selecting the right stock. Um, and, you know, kind of from, more, from a more general perspective, the more people hate something, the more they dislike it, the worse the sentiment is, the better the buying opportunity is. So you might be familiar with Sandridge from its pre-bankruptcy days that had lots of negative press, it had uh, maybe reckless or aggressive management. Um, it had a number of activists and other people involved with it. Um, the worse you emotionally respond to something, the more attractive it is generally as a financial investment, especially in the public market. And Sandridge is evidence of that. And then again, you can't just buy things that you hate. You have to buy things, in my opinion, that you emotionally don't like with the right research in place. And again, for this set of stocks that we showed, the thesis, the catalyst, at least part of it was driven by specific mispricings of macro. And now we're going to get into kind of this next macro opportunity that we're seeing that we think is driving significant opportunity. Um, here's a quick background on me. Um, University of Chicago e economics background, management consulting, private equity, worked for a multi-billion dollar family office, went out on my own. Um, ended up uh, co-founding Bison, which I'm the chief investment officer for, and um, we've run significant institutional money. Uh, we're now focused on high net worth and family office money for now, um, and uh, you know, focused on oil and gas investments. And I did run, uh, I took control of a company called RMP Energy, which was formerly a multi-billion dollar oil and gas company. And I sold off assets and sold the company and generated a substantial positive return in a negative market environment. So decent background in oil and gas and have been focused through my career on finding, fixing, um, and investing in oil and gas companies and in the energy industry. Um, so with that background, um, our take and the topic of today is um, inflation and an oil and gas update. And our take is that inflation is not transitory. Um, so here, we'll skip this. Um, so the Federal Reserve has come out and said that inflation is transitory. They have a extremely aggressive easing program in place. Um, the money supply has increased dramatically and um, there have been real, real world consequences, both of their approach and of kind of the historical underinvestment in commodities and in kind of the real economy sector. Um, the evidence that the Federal Reserve Chairman provided of inflation being transitory is this chart essentially or referencing the price movement in lumber where lumber prices had gone parabolic up and where now they've fallen materially from their all-time highs. Um, so that's basically the, you know, there's many other arguments and there are many famous economists who have made their career out of disproving inflation from a monetary perspective. Um, again, I'm a Chicago School economist by uh, training, a uh, financial analyst by experience, and, um, you know, I think I approach things a little differently and we'll, we'll show you how. And we already showed you that approaching things differently can yield substantial positive outcomes in the financial markets if done judiciously and if finding the right securities to get that exposure. So one thing to point out on this before we jump to the specific slides um, addressing this thesis 
from a lumber, oil, and kind of oil update market perspective, is if you see this chart and lumber is down a little bit more since since we pulled this, um, it's still up a lot from early 2020. It's still up a lot from 2019, 2018, and so on. And so um, this idea of observing a 5x price increase and then a 50% decrease as evidence of not having inflation obviously is a math problem and it relies on people not doing math. And where people rely on you not doing math, doing math is a huge advantage. And so again, you can kind of just draw a line through this and you can see that um, that the price for lumber is a lot higher than it was. And we're gonna go through why that is. And then we're gonna go through what's happening in oil and gas, go through some more uh, updates on oil and gas and then jump to questions. So um, there, there are some real world effects happening for lumber that are not really addressed in the ob observation that lumber prices fell a lot recently. Two things have been happening. Um, home building activity has been increasing and it's almost to the record highs seen in the housing bubble um, that peaked in 2006. We're like real close to peak levels of home building. Home prices are at record levels. Um, so this increases secondary market activity and secondary market demand for lumber in addition to primary uh, home building activity. Um, as you can see on the bottom right, home prices are at all time highs. Um, in terms of capacity, so that was the demand essentially, the supply is problematic. Um, capacity has lagged um, and part of that is it's just really expensive to build new sawmills or to expand existing ones. And the argument has been, oh, these sawmills were shut down during COVID and therefore they're not running at full capacity. As you can see on the bottom right, sawmills are actually running near their highs from a capacity perspective. Uh, their utilization is near all time highs um, and there's extremely limited room for additional utilization of these sawmills. So supply is constrained, demand is at all time highs or near all time highs, and that's why you see higher prices. This isn't really driven by the Federal Reserve printing money. Um, them printing money obviously helps in terms of driving demand, but it's not, it's not really what drove the price here. The price got driven here by capacity being insufficient versus demand. And so lower supply and higher demand yields a price movement of the type that we saw. So we get to oil and the argument from a inflation is transitory perspective is that oil is different. Um, so, you know, <laughs> this is a Houston investment club. Everyone's kind of familiar with this stuff. Um, you look at the, the rig chart and you see that um, that uh, drill baby drill is coming back to some extent. Um, the shape of this chart is promising if you're in oil field services. It's scary if you're long oil. Um, and, uh, you know, it makes it look like this time is the same essentially as last time uh, in terms of uh, drilling, potentially leading to higher production, potentially leading to lower prices. The other aspect of the oil is uh, not this time is the same and inflation related to oil is transitory is this claim around OPEC spare capacity which shows a very high potential spare capacity for oil um, if OPEC were to just disagree which again that's been in the news a little bit um, recently and uh, you know that's the, the other risk so the risks are we drill a lot this time around and flood the market again in the US and then um, OPEC turns on the spigots and crashes the price. So our take is that this is not different. And again, if you recall the, the intro, the point of this is to find interesting opportunities from our perspective and to share these opportunities in uh, you know, a format like this. And so the idea is to understand the argument, understand the kind of main narrative, and then to figure out if the narrative is correct or not and if it's substantially wrong and there are available mispricings to be able to capitalize on those mispricings. So um, if you looked at the last rig chart, um, which shows a shape that's very similar to the last recovery and look at this chart um, at the top, you see that the uh, oil price has recovered substantially, but the rig count hasn't. So the last one kind of implies that 
rig count is rocketing up and is just dependent on oil prices being a little higher to get back to prior levels, this chart shows that even with oil prices around where they were at the rig count peak in late 2018, um, at least the relevant kind of last five year rig count peak, uh, the rig count's still down by about 50%. And yeah, it's increasing a little bit, but it's nowhere near where it was. Um, we'll get into a little bit more on this, but um, this is very important. This time we need much higher oil prices to be able to get to supply levels or at least supply replacement levels that we were at before. If this looks really similar to the lumber situation, that's not an accident. Um, and we think it's very interesting to focus on lumber, see what happened to the price and how the price went up 5x, and then see the narrative to understand what's happening with oil. Similar idea on OPEC. Um, this is you know, a chart from Energy Aspects. They're an energy consulting firm, um, but there, there are similar charts elsewhere. Um, OPEC has a lot less capacity than they say, and a lot less capacity than is reported. Um, there's a lot of kind of reasons for there to be negative press about oil and gas, and um, there tends to be kind of an emphasis on the negatives for the industry and oversupply and under kind of reporting on the actual situation or any sort of potential shortages or any sort of other potential kind of challenges. So, um, this again, like you see the chart, basically capacity is way lower. Um, I would even question the UAE. They've made some noise recently about wanting to produce more. Um, they may have added this 500,000 barrels a day of capacity. They may have also had some other issues in some of their other fields, and they may actually have only added a small amount of additional capacity. Um, so got to be careful about what people actually do or are capable of doing versus what they say. And we think it's similar to the sawmills where people are saying, oh, they can add another shift or something, but where the capacity utilization is already at or near all time highs. Um, in terms of the narrative, it's interesting because you see these narratives of, you know, demand falling, you see, or, or not rising as much as people are expecting. You see narratives about OPEC um, being kind of negative and OPEC fighting and potentially dumping oil on the market. And these narratives often rely on sources that are historically consistently wrong. So this top right chart, I think is one of my favorite charts in the oil and gas industry. Um, I'll point out there's one more that we'll show towards the end, which is my other favorite chart. Um, basically, they're relying on experts who consistently underestimate demand growth every year. And so, um, you know, with like one or two exceptions. And so um, this is exciting because if the narrative is constructed by people who want to talk down demand, um, then that narrative could be potentially structurally wrong and the whole conversation may be framed the wrong way. Similarly, you have the Saudis warning about an oil supply shortage um, at the same time as the headlines are talking about potential oil um, oil being dumped onto the market by OPEC. So these are obviously very different. Um, we put out something recently, chose not to include it in this, um, where we were able to show that tanker rates, um, oil tanker rates rose into the uh, problem that OPEC had, where they, they had a true disagreement and a price war in March of last year. And they've fallen coming into this last OPEC plus meeting. And again, we, we look for these kind of interesting macro things and we try to find other sources that are outside of the norm to help us understand what's going on. Um, so this is interesting. Like there's not really a big reason to not believe the Saudis when they say that they're worried about a supply shortage. Um, this is very different from what they've said before. And it's been a very long time since they've ever talked about this. And so again, this is, it's helpful to understand kind of what the who's saying what and how reliable they are. Um, in terms of just pure numbers, uh, oil demand uh, growth is exceeding oil supply growth. Again, this is with OPEC supply curtailed, but it's still interesting. Um, I think this supply uh, chart is including estimates of OPEC plus increasing their production by 400 to 500,000 barrels a day every month this year, starting I think in March. And so um, this is very promising to the extent from an oil price perspective, all of this 
when I say promising, is promising from the lens of owning oil and gas stocks or having positive exposure to oil price increases. It's negative if you're exposed to inflation um, on a fixed income. It's negative if you're worried about inflation going runaway. And again, so so when I talk about positive, uh, positive to the price of oil and to the fundamentals of oil and gas stocks, potentially negative to neutral to the economy, negative to fixed income and so on. Um, oil inventories are depleting. Um, they just sh they just fell below the five-year average recently. Um, people have, there again, a lot of news headlines have talked about how the five-year average maybe is no longer indicative because it's at a higher level than the past five-year period average. My counter argument to that would be that demand has grown substantially, so you need more um, you need more, uh, sorry, I've just got a question coming in. Um, you need more production, you need more inventory, sorry, to meet your day's supply, uh, day's demand uh, in order, essentially like if you, if you wanna have, let's say 30 days of oil available, that amount is higher if uh, your demand worldwide is 102 million barrels a day versus like 85 million barrels a day. Um, Regardless, the, the trajectory is extremely positive, again, from the price of oil. Um, the question that came in was, um, when I say OPEC has less capacity than they announced, do I mean Saudi Arabia or Saudi Aramco also? And the answer is yes. And um, here is uh, energy aspects uh, forecast. They estimate that Saudi has a little less production capacity than they had in 2018. I would argue they have even less than this, but from a just directional perspective, I think there is some degree of consensus that the Saudis have less production capacity than they say, um, and that most OPEC plus countries have less production capacity than they say. Um, there was one other really interesting headline around this, which was that Russia actually had extra quota capacity in the last few months. And through the most recent data, they haven't increased their production despite having extra capacity in their quota. So basically they were able to go from let's say 10.5 million barrels a day to let's say 11 million barrels a day, and they're still producing 10.3 million barrels a day. So they can say they have capacity, let's say Russia can say they have capacity of like 11 and a half or 12 million barrels a day, but if they're allowed under the OPEC plus agreement to produce more and they're not producing more over a number of months, when that number of months goes to number of years, and when this happens with other OPEC plus countries, and when demand exceeds supply, like we're seeing, it makes you wonder what their actual capacity is. And our view is more than wondering, we think it's highly probable that there is insufficient OPEC production capacity relative to where we're gonna settle out on demand post COVID over the next year or two. We're seeing that in the JP Morgan chart, and we think it actually could be even more extreme than this, and we think that there is risk to the upside. But if it just works out like this, this is still highly inflationary and very different from the story that Mr. Powell was saying. Um, one interesting factor has been uh, the rig count uh, growth. So we showed that the rig count is much lower than it has been in past cycles at current oil prices. And one of the factors for that is that private companies have been ramping their oil activity, drilling activity back up. Public companies have not. Public companies are actually still well below their levels uh, from pre-COVID. Um, and they're actually somewhat close to their levels when oil was negative, which is kind of remarkable if you think about it. Like one, what were people doing drilling in April of last year? And two, if they were drilling in April of last year, why aren't they drilling a lot more now? And so some of this is related to um, a history of capital destruction where boards uh, have been under pressure and thus management teams have been under pressure to stop losing money. And so that's translated to less drilling activity and more money spent on paying off debt, paying dividends, buying back stock. And then there's been a ostensible ESG push where activists and investors from a variety of perspectives have been pushing companies to spend less money drilling, 
more money on solar and wind and other projects like that, as well as just slowing down overall. Um, this is extremely bullish for the price for oil, having a non-economic pressure that's building, preventing or, or blocking companies from spending into a price signal, which is much higher oil prices, is extremely bullish and is not something that we've seen before in the history of oil and gas, and is one reason that it's like pretty comfortable to come out and say that this is not transitory and that oil prices have significant bias to the upside in the medium to long term. Um, you know, there, this is kind of like an easy shot. Uh, 2021 electric vehicles are, are selling more than they did in 2020 by quite a bit. Um, but just generally, if you think about the number of cars sold around the world every year versus the number of electric cars sold every year, it's still a fraction, like we're talking two or three or something percent of the global fleet of new cars is electric. And so there's these stories about hyperbolic growth, about really exponential growth, rapid growth. The growth is rapid, um, right? There's, there's no denying that from a tiny number of vehicles to hundreds of thousands and maybe even a million vehicles this year, but it's nowhere near where it would need to be in order to threaten oil demand from the near to medium term. The very long term is uncertain, but the very long term is always uncertain. And right now, I would argue that the uh, hyperbole in the news and in very aggressive, radically high valuation uh, stock assessments of companies like Tesla and Nikola and whatever, I mean, some of them are just frauds like Nikola and some would argue Tesla, and some would say also that just you know companies like Tesla just don't have the production capacity. Their cars catch on fire. They have other sorts of problems that are somewhat unique to their to their cars in terms of claiming self driving and then crashing into fire trucks and trucks and so on. Um, regardless, small percentage of the fleet overall oil demand is growing on an absolute basis. And so um, every time you hear this story about electric cars. I would argue this is kind of similar to that favorite chart of mine where the narrative doesn't align with the reality on the ground. Um, importantly, uh, in the context of oil and gas stocks and kind of what we do at Bison and what we're looking at, um, oil and gas stocks are still really cheap. So we pulled this, this is something uh, another fund published uh, about Canadian oil and gas stocks. Uh, it's true for the US to some extent too. Uh, stocks are very cheap. So this tells us a few things. One is that we think it's worth doing the work and evaluating uh, companies kind of along this valuation spectrum. Just because a company is at two times cash flow and not three times cash flow doesn't mean that it's the best investment. Some of the companies on the left side of this chart we know well and are, choose not to invest in. Some of the ones towards the right side of the chart we may choose to invest in and historically there hasn't been a super high correlation in terms of picking the cheapest versus the most expensive. Um, you, you obviously want to cut off the tails, um, but the overall performance hasn't been highly correlated. But it does tell you that there is valuation dispersion and that tells you that you can still buy the right stocks for cheap. One other thing that you can see from this low valuation kind of uh, setup is that the market very much believes the narrative that inflation is transitory. If the average valuation for an oil company is three or four times EBITDA, and if you can buy a whole set of these companies at way less than that, and if you can buy them at very high free cash flow yields, that tells you that the market is betting that these things are temporary and that the valuation multiples are about to expand because oil and gas prices are about to fall. And so if we're right, which again, we've been showing data in both directions, we think there's huge potential returns. And this is another reason why, in addition to Mr. Powell saying that inflation is transitory, we think it's worth doing the work. We're happy that we've done what we're showing as well as other stuff that we're still in the process of uh, putting together to put out in white papers on our website and elsewhere. Um, and so it's, there's a huge opportunity here. We didn't miss the opportunity. You know, we're, we're along these different stocks. We showed a few of them that worked related to the macro thesis that we had and showed at the start of this presentation. And there are many more promising opportunities that we're finding. And this is still very much a 
active debate where the market is betting against us. And this is extremely promising to us because again, where we've had these specific macro views, we've been really right. And we've done really well taking kind of the other side of the consensus, the other side of kind of the Bloomberg headline, Wall Street Journal headline, et cetera. And that is available here. And it's available in some cases at two or three times cash flow, which again, wild in the context of almost zero 30 year interest rates and wild in the context of a market that's near all time highs from a valuation perspective. Um, so in terms of <laughs> the market, uh, it is, I mean, the percentage of energy stocks, and again, this includes pipelines and oil majors and other things that aren't so interesting to us and aren't as economically levered as specific producers of the type that we talked about at the beginning that we focus on, um, the overall composition of energy stocks is near the Great Depression in the index. Um, and this is, you know, this is a Bank of America slide, um, and you know, it started to rebound a little bit. As you can see in the chart on the right, energy is kind of the biggest addition uh, to indexes in uh, as, as of March uh, 31st of, of this year. And, uh, you know, we think this will rebound. And if it rebounds, those two or three times cash flow multiple stocks could very easily trade up in line with the index. And they could very easily trade up way beyond that. If you look at the move from 2001 to 2008, and obviously like this may or may not be like a 2007, 2008 type timeframe, the room for revaluation is enormous and companies can trade up a lot to get to a normal valuation multiple and they can trade up a lot as commodity prices rise. So there's like two drivers independent of company specifics and idiosyncrasies. And again, like we showed, getting those idiosyncrasies right, getting those catalysts right can lead to way above market performance. Uh, you know, we showed with Sandridge up almost 300% from where we announced our macro thesis versus XLE up like 30% and XOP up 100%. So really there's a lot of room to way outperform by selecting the specific right stocks, but also this industry in general, those indexes that again, these specific stocks are beaten, those indexes could go up multiple hundreds of percent just to catch up with the inline valuations that we've seen on average over the last hundred years. Another way of saying kind of the same thing, uh, Numera, another in industry consultant, put this out. Um, oil is the most levered way to play inflation. So if you don't believe Mr. Powell, you don't want to own gold. Gold is fine, but gold might go up 16% on average in an inflationary environment. Oil goes up 34%, again, historically in inflationary periods. So, um, Gold is good, oil is better. We'd argue oil and gas stocks are even better and the right oil and gas stocks can be the best. And there is a tremendous opportunity to get exposure to this theme to the extent that we're right. This is a busy chart. This is from JP Morgan. It's their take on what's happening. And uh, if you just focus on the top part, uh, they show a 12 year up cycle, a 12 year down cycle. And they think that we are catching the up cycle. Again, we agree, but it's kind of interesting to see this from the largest investment bank, I think top three in the world, top one, unclear. Um, and again, in the context of stocks being near all-time lows and a near all-time low percentage of the overall market, this may seem obvious, but the equities, even after they've run a lot, are still radically cheap. And there's still room for the indexes to go up multiple hundreds of percent. We just saw that in those last few charts. So again, this may feel kind of like, you know, apple pie, like it's kind of obvious, but it's not priced in from a market perspective. And that makes it very contrarian. And there's room for significant revaluation like we showed. Um, similar concept. This is essentially my second favorite chart. There's different ways to show the same thing. But oil and gas need substantial reinvestment, and we're not seeing it. And we're not seeing it partly because of ESG, and we're partly not seeing it because of shareholders who are mad after management teams and boards have incinerated giant amounts of capital. We're not seeing it through private equity, where many of the funds are seeing redemptions and are shifting to investing in green tech, despite that relatively slow adoption of electric vehicles and other sorts of uh, ostensibly environmentally friendly opportunities. And 
this tells us that we need much higher prices in order to get those rig counts way higher. If $75 oil isn't enough to get the rig count up like it was in the last cycle, maybe it's $150 oil, maybe it's $300 oil. We're not providing a specific target. We're just sharing that. This tells us, the last chart tells us, the prior charts tell us both that we need much higher oil prices in order to be able to meet the demand. Again, similar to lumber, there's been insufficient capacity investment over a decade plus period, really expensive to increase that capacity. Some of the capacity that everyone's being told we have from OPEC plus and other places isn't there. And so it may require much, much higher oil prices than we're already seeing in order to get sufficient oil investment to fight this curve that we're showing that that's just what happens if oil isn't drilled. And uh, you know, again, from a demand perspective, um, even if electric cars were fully adopted today, or let's say fully adopted by 2030, um, transportation demand for oil is only roughly 27 or so percent, 28 percent. So you'd actually see a market that's 50 percent undersupplied or 35 percent undersupplied by 2030, because if you got rid of a third of demand, um, you'd still have 66 million barrels a day of demand versus it looks like supply from this forecast would be closer to 40 million barrels a day if there was no additional drilling. So again, even if you don't believe the analysis we're doing on electric vehicles, you think there's going to be rapid adoption, you think it's going to be great and that Tesla is somehow going to meet all their targets, even though they never have, and that these other companies are going to show up, even with all of that, there still needs to be higher prices in order to incentivize additional development, in order to have enough supply to meet um, demand, as well as just to replace some of the losses that get experienced as uh, production rolls off naturally over time. This is the last one, a uh, similar concept to the last chart. This is from JP Morgan. This shows the missing CapEx from their forecasts relative to um, how much they expect to actually get spent. And again, insufficient CapEx leads to higher prices. We saw this with lumber where lumber prices went nuts. If oil did what lumber did, we'd be talking about kind of $200 oil. Um, and again, circling back to the topic, if oil does this, and oil goes up a lot more, then inflation goes up a lot more. And it kind of almost doesn't matter what the Fed does from a money supply perspective. Insufficient oil production leads to higher oil prices, especially as oil demand increases. We chose not to include some of the economic stuff on oil, but oil demand is extremely price inelastic. It doesn't really matter that much if oil is at 70 or 100 or 150 in terms of if you drive to the grocery store to pick up milk. It, it does affect a little bit some discretionary travel, but the reality is that post COVID, there is so much demand for travel and certain other things that we may actually see structurally higher demand, even at much higher oil prices. Regardless, insufficient CapEx need higher prices in order to meet projected demand and this is actually not even taking into account some of the issues with the OPEC spare capacity that we showed earlier. Um, so we're just going to uh, hop over real quick to one other uh, minor topic. Bob, Bob asked me to cover this and happy to talk about it. So um, we, we, we've made a effort at Bison somewhat recently to build our social media presence and um, there have been various um, reasons to do this. I guess one reason to do it was I took over a formerly multi-billion dollar oil and gas company and there was zero coverage and like I have to talk about it a lot because no one even kind of really paid attention to it happening. We sold off assets, we earned a great return for that company and its shareholders relative to the situation when I stepped in and I guess it was kind of one of those tree falls in a forest and no one hears it. So that was kind of the starting point of, hey, we have to start doing things a little differently or people may just never know what we're doing. And the timing of it's worked out pretty well because as we've ramped up some of our macro efforts and trying to find other types of catalysts like specific local mispricings or um, kind of a, 
uh, macro narrative that's way off from reality, um, we've been able to put up some big public wins and that's driven a lot of engagement. And our hope is that as we build additional wins, um, it broadens our exposure and makes life as a private investment fund manager uh, a little easier. So kind of just building social engagement judiciously, carefully within regulations, within compliance constraints, um, we found has been quite helpful from a business perspective and the trajectory is quite good. And I guess one thing I'll point to is um, this this one uh, tweet uh, or Twitter thread that we put together. Um, there's different strategies that we use for this. And one of them is, uh, is putting together threads from our white papers, um, which is just a series of tweets which include short summaries or short snippets from a from a thesis that when uh, strung together, uh, go through the highlights of it and help explain it. And uh, the engagement on this was much higher than prior ones. Uh, it's still very low compared to like social media influencers or some of the other kind of stuff that you'll see out there. Um, but from our perspective, it's not about building absolute audience. It's about building engagement with other investors in oil and gas, building engagement from a media perspective and kind of building our presence within kind of our target market. So this has been very productive uh, for us and it's something that I thought we'd share. Uh, you can find us easily uh, if you look for Bison Interests Twitter account or my Twitter account under Josh Young or under Bison Interests as well as on our website bisoninterests.com. You can see various white papers we've put up. We try to add links when um, I'm on TV interviews uh, with Bloomberg or Al Jazeera or various other um, various other platforms. We've done some podcasts and other stuff like that as well or participated in other and in, in, in those. And so um, we found again that to be helpful. And then we've actually sourced some investment ideas through that too, um, where people have reached out to us and asked us about investments. Um, generally we're not that interested, but occasionally like we'll always look and occasionally um, we found phenomenal ideas uh, through that medium as well. So it's very good for us uh, in terms of sourcing investment ideas as well. So here's our contact info. Um, again, kind of easiest way to follow us is, is checking out our website, signing up for our mailing list, um, you know, seeing our, our white papers as they come out, seeing our tweets. Uh, and then if you're interested in engaging further, happy to um, engage in those conversations. Again, none of this is meant as an investment solicitation or anything like that. The goal is to educate, share our very divergent view on inflation versus the federal chairman and or federal reserve chairman and versus the uh, market and how the market is pricing the securities that we're involved with, as well as kind of overall oil and gas equities, bonds, et cetera. And so hopefully this has been helpful and happy to open this up for more questions. And oh, this disclaimer is very important. Yes, so if uh, anyone has any questions for Josh, if you please type them in the uh, question entries, uh, question area, I'll uh, forward them on, on to him. Um, Okay, uh, let me try something uh, new here, Josh. Okay. If you look at your uh, go to webinar, I'm going to assign this question to you. And let me see if you uh, are able to see that pop up somewhere. Do you see that anywhere on your control panel? I don't, I don't see. Oh, here, yes, questions. Let's see, underrated energy stocks. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we're gonna stay away from talking about specific uh, stocks on this, again, from a compliance perspective. The goal here is to educate kind of broadly about the uh, space. No, this is a, a question from Henry. Hold on a second. Uh, frustrating trying to uh, work with uh, multiple windows here. If you check your signal account here, I'll send it on. 
I see. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so again, like there were questions about a number of different stocks. Um, so um, so what did I think in t March 2020? Um, you know, I didn't know that. I guess I I didn't expect world governments to respond the way they did. Um, I tracked a lot of the data early on in terms of China and in terms of these cruise ships. And um, the assessment that I came to from talking to a number of epidemiologists and econometricians and statisticians and, and doing some of the data work myself was that if they did some of the shutdowns that China was doing or that they talked about, that the collateral damage would be an order of magnitude higher than the lives saved uh, through reduced hospitalizations. So um, the data was somewhat obvious that shutdowns were wrong. And the bet I made was that they wouldn't do something that was horrific to the global economy and that would have a disproportionate negative effect to citizens um, and to their economies. Um, and that was wrong. And it looks like some of it is that the legislators were actually betting on individual stocks that would benefit if they shut down. Some of it was like very powerful special interests um, kind of pushing things. Some of it was probably bad policy analysis. And so, um, so I was wrong on that. I think I was right still in the data is that, you know, these shutdowns have been horrific um, and that at least as many people have died from missing surgeries, from missing treatment that they needed, uh, from suicides, from uh, more poverty and inability to get a variety of things. So, so it's been, I think the analysis was right in terms of outcome, uh, like what would happen, but wrong in terms of judgment. Um, so going into the oil, like the OPEC price war and going into kind of shutdowns worldwide for indefinite periods of time, uh, it was hard to tell how long it would take. Um, what I did was a few things. So one, I bought some oil tanker stocks, which did poorly, but they hedged my portfolio. And so what was gonna happen was if it continued for a while, those stocks were gonna go up another five or 10 or 20 X and that would protect the remainder of the portfolio that had been devastated during um, this OPEC price crash. Um, in addition to that, um, I repositioned the portfolio towards companies like I showed that had really specific macro or uh, specific company catalysts that were likely to outperform um, even if prices stayed low, uh, but where these kind of specific things that were changing and weren't appreciated uh, were playing out. So, you know, like companies exposed to the Waha hub, uh, companies exposed to Midcon from a gas perspective or NGL perspective, um, other kind of really specific things, companies that had huge oil discoveries, but no one paid attention because like oil prices are really low. Um, so that's how I navigated it. Um, there could be a roller coaster. There's a lot of risk in the short term. Um, I mean, the Delta variant looks like it's nothing, um, like even more nothing than COVID was kind of in the first place um, in terms of the negatives versus shutting down entire social and economic systems. Again, like we are very, very fortunate in the 21st century and have been very fortunate, had been in the late 20th century, um, things have been the best by a lot in the history of humanity and disrupting social and economic systems introduces huge risks. I think people don't appreciate this enough and this is maybe verging on a different sort of analysis, but like if you look at Russia and like the 19, in 1913 versus Russia in 1935, um, population was down by, I don't know, like a third or something from starvation from a country that was actually doing pretty well and modernizing. Um, there are huge risks to change and it's really important to kind of navigate things carefully. So um, that being said, uh, I think there, the populations in general around the world are mostly not tolerant of further shutdowns. So I think that it's not very likely that there will be more shutdowns. There were huge protests in the UK when there were relatively smaller shutdowns around this Delta variant. And the hospitalization data, as well as the mortality, is such that it looks like this one's even less of a thing than, so there'll be an epsilon, of course, because there are people that make money from this, and there's kind of a whole cottage industry um, pushing this. Um, 
but uh, I think it's very unlikely that we see another um, shock. Um, I guess one thing that I think is worth thinking about, I'm going to dodge the which oil and gas stock specifically to buy. That's not really the, the point of this and making no recommendations, uh, just a view that inflation is not transitory and that oil prices likely in the medium to long term go up a lot. I think it's really risky to um, emerge from a crisis and then focus on that crisis again. Um, if you think about kind of the uh, history of uh, stocks, the stock market over the last couple hundred years. Um, if you look at kind of the history of crises, almost never does the same thing happen twice in a row. So everyone was worried about a financial crisis after 2008, and you had instead like messy EU stuff happening, you know, 2010 to 2014. Um, you had an oil crisis in 2014 as OPEC fell apart and dumped oil on the market. Um, You've had various other kind of monetary crises, um, but you haven't had this financial crisis that happened in 2008. Um, and banks are a lot more stable. Um, you know, real estate's reinflated, so there could be another real estate crash. But like focusing on the last one is not great. Focusing on two ago, three ago, whatever makes sense. But like if you focus too much on the most recent downturn, you end up potentially um, positioning for risk. Um, you end up positioning for risk that's less likely actually, but expensive to position for, and you might be under positioned for other risk that might actually be statistically much more likely. So um, again, I think uh, could happen. You could see oil price crash again. There's a variety of different things that could drive it. Um, it just actually seems pretty unlikely relative to the many other things that could happen um, in, uh, in the market and in the world. And so I think relatively speaking, oil is well positioned, partly because it went negative last year, partly because of massive underinvestment, partly because OPEC has way less capacity, partly because demand is rising, even as governments try to shut down and their citizens don't allow them to. Um, so I don't know, it looks pretty good from here and it seems pretty unlikely that the next crash is an oil crash. Uh, there are many other things that seem far more likely to have problems than oil and gas from here. Okay, uh, I've got a question. Uh, could you go back to your slide on the uh, production capacity of uh, OPEC and Russia? Sure. Here, one second. Let me see if I can get this. Okay. Um, the the one showing the depleted capacity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Right there. Uh, if we just talk about that for uh, a little bit, when it's showing the decrease in capacity for Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Russia. Now, is that decrease uh, in capacity is is that relating related to production capacity, or is that uh strictly with regards to actual proven reserves have diminished they've they've uh we've uh, uh, the countries have, have, have extracted the oil but have not uh replaced them with additional reserves or is it also a combination of uh, less potential reserves out there beyond what is actually known so um i excluded a slide um on just historical spend on exploration. Spend on global oil exploration has been falling for over two decades. And so um, there have been way fewer discoveries, partly because there probably aren't as many giant fields out there as there were, um, because we've discovered the easy to find ones. Um, so the statistical likelihood of success on large exploration is lower, as Exxon keeps seeing as they miss over and over again in Guyana. Again, not widely reported, but like I think they're five in a row or something at this point on exploration misses um, in that trend. You know, they've, they've hit development successes and delineation successes, but their exploratory program has been disastrous. Um, and uh, so, so spend on that's been down a lot. So new reserve builds in places where you can easily <laughs> uh, verify them are down a lot. Um, OPEC reserves 
are mostly fake and kind of widely understood to be fake. Um, there was a book, Twilight and Desert, that addressed that. And, um, you know, it's basically kind of a given. It was funny because like Matt Simmons put that out and then got hired by Saudi to help them figure out what to do. And I know people that went over there and worked on that. And, you know, it's less terrible than it was when he put out that book, but it's still true. Um, you can't really believe the reserve estimates that governments put out about their own reserves. There's a lot of reasons to make different representations than the reality. Um, th th this trip specifically is just production capacity. So it's just like how much they could produce um, if they turned it on. And uh, th there, there are problems with this methodology and there are problems with any sort of estimate methodology, um, kind of similar to predicting the future. Uh, future's hard. <laughs> um, but uh, I think what I like about this is less the exact numbers and more that it's someone else credible showing numbers around something that we kind of know and have had trouble historically measuring. So we're working on this right now, and we actually think that supply capacity is lower than estimates around the world, not just OPEC. This isn't to pick on OPEC. This is a result of global underinvestment in exploration and development. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of this specifically, this is saying that they can produce less than they could have produced in October of 2018, mostly, and it shows how much less. And then it does show three countries that could produce more and how much more, again, from their analysis they could produce. Okay. Uh, and then I guess one more thing just on scale. So supposedly OPEC spare capacity, um, you know, when I showed that, uh, slide here, we'll go back one. Um, supposedly spare capacity is a little over 8 million barrels a day, or maybe it's seven and change, depending on exactly how you read the recent uh, agreement. Well, not the, the recent uh, meeting didn't yield an agreement, but the prior meeting where they had a schedule for reductions. Um, so you're kind of in this like seven to eight-ish million barrel a day excess capacity from OPEC. Um, but if you, skip from that, that doesn't really factor in that's IEA, same guys that underestimate demand, they frequently overestimate supply. Um, when you look at this chart, you see, it looks like, you know, just eyeballing it approximately 2 million barrels a day of less capacity. Um, my understanding is that's not factored into the IEA figures. So you're talking about maybe five to six million barrels a day of spare capacity from OPEC. And if you're at five to six million barrels a day of spare capacity, but you're in a market where it's likely to grow demand, just rebound from pre-COVID levels as travel reopens and as various countries like India reopen, as international travel again expands again, um, you know, that, that's way too little. You need like 10 million barrels a day of spare capacity. So even the IEA numbers are too low relative to what you need. And then energy aspects work is telling us that it might be way too low and that that JP Morgan chart from later in the presentation might actually be understating the case. Um, and again, I wouldn't be too surprised if, here, let's find this. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised if demand ends up being higher than this because here, let's find it, sorry. Um, if, uh, apologies for, for having to flip through so many of these. Um, there we go. Um, if demand ends up growing faster than JP Morgan is forecasting, which seems to be the case right now, um, so far demand has far exceeded everyone's estimates, consensus, et cetera, um, there might actually just be not enough production capacity and we might, it al already might be not enough and we might see evidence of that I mean, we might be seeing evidence of that with just inventories falling, but when OPEC turns on all their production over the next year to year and a half, there may just be missing two or three million barrels a day, and you might need way higher oil prices from that to incentivize development to be able to get production back up. We also need exploration, which hasn't been happening again. So, I mean, these are, these are real problems from a price perspective, and we're just starting to see them. And, you know, this is where people get scared when prices move up, but um, getting back to Sandridge, which here, I'll just flip back to that for a second, just to kind of show, um, to talk about what happened prior to our investment 
in Sandridge and discussion in Sandridge. So, so we show this starting in the beginning of November um, of 2020 on the bottom right. Um, Sandridge stock, I think, went down to like 50 cents or something like that. And at this point, it was at $1.70. So Sandbridge had more than tripled. Um, one of my clients knew that we were invested for various reasons. And um, I guess like he knew the CEO and he was pressuring us to sell. And this happens a lot with public equities. People have very strong opinions um, and sometimes they're right. And you know, it was a very scary time and oil prices had fallen and natural gas prices had fallen. And he pointed out you know, the stock had more than tripled and or tripled or doubled whatever it was like it had gone up a lot in that time frame and you know i i read the work because you know he's a very smart guy independently wealthy um very astute and it was actually cheaper at a dollar 70 at this point where we published our research than it was when it was at 70 cents and part of that was oil and gas prices had gone up and part of it was um, they had generated additional cash flow and they had improved the value of some of their assets and they had sold assets we didn't give it a lot of credit for. And so um, I think there's a lot of risk in looking at price charts, historical price charts, and deciding based on the historical price chart that something is cheap or expensive. And I think a lot of what we do as investment managers, and I think this is generally true for good investment managers, is absorb a lot of the emotional kind of aspect of investing and absorb a lot of the angst. And it's not like we don't feel it. You have to feel it, I think. Again, this is my personal philosophy. I have to feel it, I have to process it, I have to become okay with it, and I have to do what the math says, regardless of how bad or weird it feels. And I think I like to joke sometimes about how um, in market crashes, I hide under my desk and I click buy. And so this is kind of the equivalent of that in the other way. The stock tripled, we doubled up on the stock and it's like 550 or $6 or whatever right now, less than a year later from things that we knew at that time and we were just told that we were wrong. So again, like there's this huge potential. So I think the risk on, on this question that we're asked, hey, could this happen again and so on, I think there's a lot of that same sort of bias where, hey, things have been tough and oil prices have fallen a lot before after they've moved like this, aren't they gonna do that again? And the answer is maybe, right? But like, it almost doesn't matter because if you bought Sandridge at $1.70 and it fell to a dollar and then it went to $6, like, do you really care, right? Don't use margin, be careful with how you do it, accept that there's gonna be high volatility. Um, and I guess there's one other thing, which is like Buffett has talked about this a little bit, Munger's talked about it a little bit, various other great value investors have talked about it. And it sounds really weird, but what you wanna do is reduce your risk of permanent capital loss. Like don't actually lose money um, in the end, but like if you can buy a Sandridge at $1.70 when the basis is great and it tells you that things are gonna be amazing for the company over time, you, you have to be able to not care when you buy it at $1.70, one, that it moved up from 70 cents or 50 cents or whatever its low was, and two, you have to not care that it could easily go to a dollar on its way to 550 or six dollars. And so it sounds weird, it feels weird, it's something that we've done a lot at Bison. It's part of why we named the firm Bison because we face into the storm. But the returns associated with being right on the analysis on something like Sandridge are, are very different from getting exposure through an index where you still take a lot of that potential downdraft risk if oil prices fall. Um, so the upside is high, the downside is mitigated to some extent by being right on the catalysts and right on the specific company research. Um, and so again, I would the analog here is for oil. I think it makes a lot of sense to, um, to not uh, get scared, to be very careful, to not use leverage, uh, and to own kind of the right stocks that are able to do well. Um, there was actually one specific stock that was asked about that actually we published research on. Um, so I'll happily talk about this particular one. Again, there's no kind of general recommendations here, but uh, the question was about Cabot. Um, so <laughs> um, one of the funny things about being in this business and focused on it as a public equity investment analyst and then having run an oil and gas company as a chairman of a public oil and gas company, having sold it and looked at kind of how these things work from under the hood, 
there are some companies that did really well historically and where their fundamental business is much less promising going forward than it was going back. And there are other companies where the reverse is true. So Sandridge was a great case of a company that had been horrifically bad and where things got better, um, or at least they got less bad. And so the stock was trading at like one times cash flow. Um, you know, they had all this upside to improving uh, mid-con natural gas basis. They were going from selling their gas for almost nothing to getting two or three dollars in MCF for their gas, right? Huge improvements. Um, their cost uh, structure was high, so there was a ton of operating leverage. Even though they had no financial leverage, their stock was able to more than double XOP and again do like 6x or 8x what uh, XLE did. Cabot is in the inverse of that. Cabot historically has done very well, but they are almost out of their core inventory. It's not an accident that they're trying to merge with Simrex. It's shocking that Simrex is willing to merge with them, and it appears that Simrex may not have done some fairly simple and easy fundamental work associated with that. And, you know, <laughs> uh, it's always risky to talk about specific stocks because people tend to build kind of emotional uh, connections to them. Similar sort of effect to what I was talking about with um, Sandridge and uh, with kind of these short-term price move observations and concern around risk. Um, but, you know, people have made a lot of money historically on Cabot. Um, I, I would say the risk there, because they did so well historically and because they're basically out or nearly out of their best inventory, um, the risk there is very much to the downside. They're a very richly priced stock versus their peers. Um, and the story they tell has very little to do, it appears, with the fundamentals when evaluated compared to other similar oil and gas stocks. So again, I think it's very important to kind of emotionally uh, dis, uh, disattach or like experience the emotions and then recognize them and just do the math. And, you know, Cabot, um, if you look at a, a location map, you can see kind of what I'm talking about. And there have been great publications out there by independent research analysts that show problems there. And again, our take at Bison is just to not have, like we try to have as little of our own view about stuff as possible and, as, and find as many brilliant people and experts and uh, various data sources that help us come to a kind of mosaic view on something. And the mosaic in this case for Cabot is uh, scary. So we don't short stocks. Um, I don't know if we would short Cabot or not if we did short stocks. Uh, but we definitely don't own it. And underwriting Cabot is tough because even if the stock fell 50%, it probably still wouldn't be that interesting to us. And even though we like Simrex, we didn't own it before, we're way less interested in Simrex now than we were prior to their announcement of their merger with Cabot. So sorry for the uh, <laughs> uh, long answer to a somewhat short question, but I will talk about that one just because we did a lot of work on it. And the what you find under the hood is really different from publicly disclosed information from what we can tell. Um, and again, no recommendation on it, just uh, I think illustrative on the other side of things where you can some, sometimes find much more like we did with Sandwich and sometimes find much less than you'd expect at a much higher valuation th than you'd think. Okay. Uh Taking on a uh, global perspective of uh, oil companies, uh, taking into account the ESG, environmental, social, and governments, and the uh, this capital starvation they appear to be in now, uh, do you can you see oil companies becoming solar companies or biofuel companies? If you remember, for example, BP, British Petroleum, had commercials a few years ago about them. Uh, turning into a green company. Um, yeah, so so I think some companies are doing that, and it's very bullish for oil, and it's very bullish for the share price prospects of companies that are not doing that. So I think the odds of BP being good at this is very low. Um, and so far, looking at the track record of oil companies that have done this sort of like green shift or green washed or whatever, the returns for them on their like solar and whatever projects appear to be lower than the average for those industries. So um, <laughs> like just our basic philosophy is investing in good companies with good assets and good management teams and, um, and then finding a positive catalyst, finding 
companies that are like less good than average at something that are aggressively pursuing it for what appear to be uneconomic reasons, um, it's very easy. We just don't own them. And, you know, if we shorted stocks, maybe they'd be really interesting to have as kind of a short basket. So, you know, there are individual companies, I think like Orsted did well with this in, in Norway, but they did it partly because they bought stuff and then resold it to BP and I think Statoil or something. So if you are in the palm and flip business rather than in the own it and cash flow it business, maybe it works, but like that's a little bit of a kind of multi-level marketing scheme or pyramid scheme versus actually earning positive full cycle returns. So uh, yeah, I think, I think it's great for oil and gas prices and great for smaller competitors that are continuing to focus on the oil and gas business. Um, and it's astonishing that companies like BP are doing this and Shell and Exxon now. And I mean, it's, I mean, I have a, a brilliant global macro investor friend who went all in on oil, literally the maximum exposure he can get on oil um, the day that engine number one won in their proxy battle with Exxon. And, you know, I think terrifying if you're an Exxon inv investor, um, even more terrifying if you're a BP or Shell investor because they're further along and even further committed um, and very exciting, I think, for global oil macro stuff and for inflation again kind of getting back to that topic like the less people invest in the thing that lubricates the world economy um the more likely it is that those prices go up even more and so again fixed income gets scarier and scarier and the prospects for oil and gas companies get better and better but only those companies that are actually keeping their oil and gas prospects and not taking their money and investing it in below average return projects. All right. Personally, I, I find it very difficult to envision seasoned drilling engineers, seasoned geologists and geophysicists getting emotionally attached to solar panels. I just uh, find that hard to comprehend. Yeah, I think I think it's maybe good that they're not emotionally attached to them. I think, uh, although I have met employees that are responsible for some of these projects and they feel passionately about these projects. So maybe it's not the drilling engineers, but it's like other people, the organizations that actually have very strong emotional affinities for these projects. Um, the, the stronger the emotional affinity, the more concerning it is to me. I'd rather people do stuff that they are, um, that they find intellectually stimulating, but emotionally neutral rather than organizations that are emotionally very positively disposed towards something. Um, it just, uh, um, I think I think there's a greater risk of uneconomic behavior in a variety of perspectives uh, for, in, in that sort of situation. Okay, I'm gonna pass on a question uh, to you from, uh, from Daniel. And related to that, we've been talking about uh, electric vehicles and electrification of uh, society. But that leaves out lots of other areas where uh, oil is used. Uh, just for example, the population explosion of the world. We're gonna have increased food production needs. And uh, when you have food production, you've got demand for various oil products fuel for the tractors, byproducts for fertilizers. Uh, I mean, can you imagine battery powered uh, farm tractors? I, I just, anyways. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of things that oil is kind of the highest and best use uh, fuel source for, um, I mean, Kind of ironically, we keep seeing this with lithium ion batteries. They're, they're terrible as fuel sources for transportation. Um, they're like maybe okay for like golf carts, but um, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time as engineers and as societies building up the infrastructure, the safety mechanisms, the fuel delivery, um, the engines uh, for internal combustion. Um, and, and lithium ion is just not, I mean, there will likely be future battery 
um, storage uh, chemistries and approaches, but it's just not there. So, um, and it, it's like, it's also not stable. I mean, you see Tesla's catching on fire uncontrollably. Um, you see passengers and drivers stuck in their vehicles and unfortunately incinerated. Um, the, the, there are various aspects of it that actually like weirdly people think that battery powered vehicles would be kind of more stable and less likely to ignite um, and that doesn't appear to be the case. So um, kind of from a transportation perspective in places where there are huge financial subsidies, people will buy electric cars because um, because obviously they're like very subsidized, but um, and, and so you're essentially getting paid to do it, but uh, there haven't been like generally where oil or oil products are used because oil has been relatively expensive to alternatives um, and because it's so heavily taxed in so many places of the world, generally those are the highest and best uses for oil, excluding like, some places in the Middle East where they burn oil for power, which is getting close to zero at this point, but, but still a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, generally just oil consumption has been tied to global GDP. And interestingly, GDP in countries like India and China is still growing. And there's this huge middle class in these countries and then in even kind of poorer um, frontier markets and more kind of emerging countries um, where most of the people don't have cars and the first car they can buy is most likely to be an internal combustion engine car because they're so much cheaper and so much more reliable and so um you know demand structurally is increasing there and it is kind of a very weird thing to see from a societal perspective both kind of this extreme wokeness along with extreme environmentalism because if you really believe that all people are equal and all people have equal rights and those rights should be promoted, uh, you would think that there should be equal access in the world to transportation um, as necessary. And you know, there are actually many places where it's more important to have a car than New York City or Boston um, or San Francisco. And so it's very strange to see people very aggressively pursuing certain social agendas for their own countries and then environmental agendas that would exclude poor people from having the best transportation that's relevant and necessary for them to get out of extremely difficult uh, personal, economic, and social situations. So um, there's huge pent up demand. There are literally billions of people that would like to own cars or like to own gas powered scooters. And the use case for those is far superior to the use case for electric vehicles and, and the cost curve isn't even close. I mean, you'd need electric cars to fall by like 70 or 80% to be competitive with some of these entry level internal combustion engines, or you need oil to go up by like 10 X or more. And it's possible that one or both of those does eventually happen, but not for a very, very long time. Yeah. It's just uh, amazes me. If you remember back in uh, December, Christmas time and, uh, uh, the, the clothing company North Face refused uh, Texas Oil and Gas Company's Christmas gift order because of this uh, environmentalist uh, phenomenon going on, but they they don't realize that so much of the material that they use is derived from oil byproducts. Yeah, yeah, that too. I mean, there's a whole set of of uses for oil and gas, but like. I mean, I guess my point was just like, yeah. you don't have to assume that transportation goes away. Again, the math is that if, if transportation man, demand went away, aggregate demand would be well in excess of aggregate supply. So you'd have higher prices anyway, but you don't need to assume that because it's not likely. And if you look at what seems likely, um, it seems likely that more oil will be used for transportation in 10 years rather than less. And yeah. If you're looking for it, it's not necessarily in the US or in Europe, it's in India and China and Sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of Southeast Asia and South America. Although South America has gone, uh, there, there have been some revolutions there essentially at the ballot box um, that are terrifying. And interestingly, um, people worry about 
uh, oil or talk about oil oversupply or whatever, but like Chile is basically OPEC for copper and Chile just went far radical left. They, they had the equivalent of the Bolsheviks coming into power, it looks like. I know a number of people with relatives in Chile who are working on getting their relatives out. Um, it is terrifying and that matters a lot for oil because lithium and copper, well, copper in particular from Chile, um, but commodity prices may be rising structurally. I mean, if you look at what happened to stuff that was coming out of Russia for the first 20 years of their communist revolution, I mean, <laughs> uh, production unfortunately collapsed and, and it was horrific in terms of the uh, specific um, implications for the people living there. And there's no reason to believe that Chile will be different. Um, so th there actually may be a supply crunch on copper and then on some of the other things that are that electric vehicles are dependent on. And so um, you might actually see electric vehicle costs rise even more um, and availability fall even more. So it could be, could be interesting structurally in terms of how this kind of green transition could even happen with uh, left-wing transitions happening right now. Um, so so uh, lumber decline, this question came in, uh, happy to, to address that real fast. Um, so lumber prices went up 5X in um, like a few months. And so, uh, here, we're gonna go all the way back. I apologize for, hopefully this isn't, there we go. Um, so when things go parabolic, it is, uh, there is a tendency for them to level out, uh, to, to fall and then level out or then return to rising. Um, so what happened was when the price went up 5X, people deferred consumption. So um, part of our bullish view is that uh, that, that consumption is uh, radically reinvigorated um, at these current lower prices. Um, and so you know, we're seeing actually a number of different lumber kind of primary data inputs that, that look like uh, demand is picked up a lot, but there, there's some consumers do react to rapid price changes and uh, lumber was something that's more easy to defer than oil consumption. So what gives us comfort around kind of this not staying too long is uh, that home prices are still really high, home building activity is still really high. Most homes that are being sold by home builders aren't built yet. Um, and many of those are already sold out. And so um, there's a lot of kind of structural demand. And what some of those home builders did was waited a couple of months after lumber prices peaked in early May. And now they're out there buying that lumber and building houses with it. So there was a temporary demand cessation. It was almost a price shock that um, hit demand for a brief period of time. Um, and again, prices are high. Uh, for housing and interest rates just fell, which reinvigorated the housing market more, inventory is even tighter. Uh, I mean, this this housing boom, like <laughs> watch out below if when it ends, but in the meantime, lumber demand is super strong and uh, we're just seeing essentially demand that was pushed off by a couple months catching up. So the price fell in response to that, still very high relative to where it was a couple of years ago. And we actually see it it, it could end up back at a thousand over the next year or two versus I think it's at like 600 now and it was at like 200 or something at the start of 2020. Um, okay, so a question came in, is there a case that at some point crude oil is not priced in US dollars? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, like people ask these questions about like pricing things in gold. So like John Paulson famously after he made all this money on shorting, um, um, on, you know, betting against uh, housing and on um, getting long CDS, uh, he denominated one of his funds in terms of gold as he went massively long gold. Um, that didn't work out very well. Uh, partly because that was like the peak <laughs> of gold prices, um, at least at the time. And uh, I think I think thinking about things like many of the people that have been pushing Bitcoin have talked about denominating things in Bitcoin versus denominating them in dollars. 
and supposedly this was the big realization by the CEO of MicroStrategies who ran a giant um, inflated stock, I guess I'll just call it that, in the 90s that uh, deflated rapidly in the early 2000s um, and caused I think it was over billions of dollars. I don't remember the exact order of magnitude of capital destruction um, and appears to be positioning potentially to do the same if Bitcoin prices fall. Um, so generally, I think the best way to think about it is to denominate things in the currency that you're using as a reference point if that currency is relatively stable versus other currencies. So the dollar, relatively speaking, is somewhat stable. Yeah, the Federal Reserve is out there printing a whole bunch or you know, functionally printing through um, monetary easing, um, but so is the ECB, so is Japan, so is China. China actually just lowered their interest rates recently. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it makes sense to denominate things in currencies and to think about them from a currency perspective, as well as thinking about them from a supply and demand perspective. So, I, you know, I can both think that there may be significant inflation and think that it makes sense to measure things in terms of dollars simultaneously. Okay, another question for you. Okay, so there's a question about what Bison's investment candidates look like. So, so again, we'll we'll keep this very broad to avoid. Again, this is not an offering of Bison Investment Fund. Um, you know, happy to chat with people on an individual basis. Um, but, but again, this is not that the purpose of this is to discuss oil and inflation, as well as kind of to have provided some credentials for like why we think we're well positioned to assess this and why we might be better positioned to assess this than uh, pundits and ostensible experts and reporters and news media outlets and so on. So, um, but, you know, asked specifically, sure, I'll talk about a little bit about like what we're looking at and looking for. Um, and it's just pretty simple. So like the companies, um, and I'll just use the, the these backup materials to, to address this. Um, so these companies that we use as examples are, I think, pretty good um, examples of the kinds of things that we're interested in. So we generally prefer liquidity over illiquidity. We'll buy illiquid stocks or very small stocks if there's enough upside potential um, and we own some, but we also generally just prefer to own bigger companies. Like it, all things being equal, I'd rather own a $10 billion market cap versus a billion if there's you know the same valuation disconnect. And I'd rather own a stock that trades a billion dollars a day or $10 million a day versus a stock that trades $10,000 a day. Um, and then uh, generally my preferred time frame to own an investment is one day. Um, if the stock goes up as much as the stock did on the bottom left there, up almost a thousand percent over you know a seven month period, that's great. Um, if it goes up that much in a day, great. <laughs> we'll sell it and move on. Uh, that's like kind of a snarky answer, but like really what we're trying to do is find things where they're likely to go up a lot and buy them. And um, Obviously, I'm cognizant of short-term capital gains taxes and I'm not loving what I'm seeing about potential additional taxes. Um, and so I, I take into account tax implications when I trade stocks. And I think just generally speaking, I'm not a tax advisor, but it does make sense. I think, I think it's possible to earn a lot better returns over time for an individual, again, subject to advice from their financial advisor and tax advisors, I think avoiding short-term capital gains is generally a good idea. Um, but, uh, you know, really what we're just trying to do is find things where we have a strong variant view um, and where there's good management, good assets, good balance sheets. So uh, Sandridge is a good example. They had essentially no net debt. They had a good turnaround guy in there who was very stable and very likely to do exactly what he was saying. Um, Carl Icahn kind of controlling the board, which is kind of uh, uh, unclear in terms of good or bad, but uh, was at least likely to be supportive of the management they had just hired for a period of time. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that sort of set up and, and everyone hated it. And so like, you know, the good news for Western Canada, one that's Baytex, similar idea, everyone hated it. They, and, and they all thought, so they thought that 
Sandbridge was still run by Tom Ward, who was CEO four CEOs ago, um, and they thought that Baytex was massively over levered and was likely to go bankrupt soon. Neither of those were remotely true. Um, different people are running both those companies versus when they got those reputations. Um, they're very different companies from what people remember them as. So that that's ideal is people just not understanding the thing and just playing like, I mean, it's almost like getting on a field where there's like little leaguers and coming on as like a, you know, professional baseball player, but almost playing like a different sport, right? They're like throwing a, a softball and you're able to hit it like a baseball or something. Like it's just like for Sandbridge, it was just a different sport almost similar with Baytex, similar with this other one. So um, that's our preference in terms of what we look for. And I think from a macro perspective, I think it's promising that there are these sorts of opportunities available. And like we pointed out about the valuations, like there are great opportunities still in oil and gas. And that tells us partly from a macro perspective that the macro looks great because um, when valuations get stretched and when they kind of are in line with the market or at a premium to the market historically, that's a good time to be thinking about not owning those things. Um, again, just based on how cyclical they've been over time, but when they're still really cheap and people still have these like false narratives about companies and when there's very, very few people doing what we're doing, um, we're, we're, we love being in the space when, when there's so few competitors, there's so little um, sell side coverage on these companies, the people covering them, like anyone, many of the very best sell side analysts have moved on, started their own investment firms, went to other sectors, Many of the private equity guys have moved to uh, investing in kind of green tech or, you know, <laughs> some of the value guys will call it like green fraud, essentially, because many of these companies have turned out to be not what they've represented, like Nikola, where they rolled the truck downhill, filmed it sideways and called it a functioning hydrogen uh, truck. But, but if you guys have more specific questions about Bison, feel free to reach out. Again, this is not a sales pitch. Just happy to educate you guys about what we're doing and what we're seeing and uh, really excited about what we're seeing from an inflation perspective and about having such a different view in a space where people have been right for so long that they're just like <laughs> almost not even trying. And, you know, again, similar to these individual stocks that we pointed to, like this is a really exciting time to have this sort of exposure and to be involved in, in this sort of business. Okay, Josh, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, thank you for uh, taking this additional time and uh, answering all these questions on the fly from our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys very much for having me um, here. I'm going to turn this uh, screen share off. And, uh, you know, this has been a, a great, a great opportunity to, to get to chat with you guys. And, you know, I'm happy to, to answer questions kind of individually if people want to um, fi find me and, and reach out. Uh, you know, info at Bison Interest is a good email address to, to get me at. You can find us on our website and submit a, a question through the contact form. Um, can see us on Twitter and see our white papers, sign up for our email list, however you guys want to, um, or not. And it's, it's just a great opportunity to get to, to collect some of the thoughts that we've been uh, putting together and to be able to share it with an intelligent audience and to get these, these questions were really great. So it's good, good to get to, to think um, while, while, while doing one of these things. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah. Again, ha have a wonderful weekend, everybody. And again, thank you so much, uh, Josh. Uh, you had a really wonderful and informative presentation. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Okay. So have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, thank you. Webinar is ending.